titled the message this morning, What If It's All True? We read this morning from Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, that wasn't 10.30 in the morning, that was like dawn for some of you who don't know. The women took the spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men clothed in what seemed like gleaming lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. Like every time in Scripture you ever find where people come in contact with an angel, you find that they fall down to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the words of the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went in anyway. Wondering to himself, What has happened? And this morning, we speak of these things. Would you pray with me one more time? Father, for what we know not, teach us. For what we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your Son's sake. Amen. The New Testament provides a fact-based account. Evidence, if you will, that Jesus rose from the dead. There were eyewitness accounts. There was the empty tomb. And there was the striking change in the disciples all of which reveal the truth of Christianity. Through his word, Jesus calls each of us to faith in the gospel, the good news. And those who believe are called to share his story with this broken world. Now, whatever happened to the body of Jesus, one thing is very clear. And that is, it was no longer in the tomb. All of the records make this perfectly plain. It is that one main thing, a plain thing, in which you come to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that by Sunday morning the tomb was empty does not 
prove that Jesus was alive. It simply proves that the tomb was empty. It's called circumstantial evidence. It's sort of the kind of evidence that Columbo, for 30 years on American TV, managed to handle with great skill. You know, with his crumped up raincoat, collar turned up, his one bad eye, and then his statement that he said over and over again, just one more thing. This definitely would have been one of Columbo's just one more thing. He used to say, and I, I, I remember this over and over again, he'd say, I'm just trying to tie up a few loose ends, sir. He knew exactly what he was doing. It was smooth. From Luke's account, he gives us the who, what, when, where, why. It was Sunday after Passover. It was early in the morning, dawn. It was at the tomb. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and some of the other women that were there. They had come to finish what we know of as the embalming process. And Luke, he gives us a very honest report. Luke says that when the women went back to the disciples with the news of the empty tomb, that they did not immediately burst into song. Their reaction was not to start singing, see what a morning all glorious and bright. They didn't say, it was a morning like this. In actuality, the response was that of unbelief. Luke says that the message and the way it was conveyed by the women seemed to them to be nothing more than an idle tale, an old wife's tale. I'll never forget, Virginia was pregnant with, with Simra. And one of the ladies here in the church, no, no, no longer here now, so don't go looking around told her, oh, now don't hang any curtains. If you hang curtains while you're pregnant, you, the cord will be wrapped around the baby's neck. An old wives' tale. It's worth pointing out and acknowledging that this is the view of many in our contemporary society today. It, it might actually be your view as you come here this morning. You have said to yourself, whatever I know about it, however much I regard what has seemingly taken place, to me, it seems to be superstition, an idle tale. Whatever hopes these disciples cherished to this point had been obliterated by the crucifixion. The gospel writers provide us with a picture of a group of men demoralized and paralyzed at the events of the week. John says that by the evening on the first day of the week they were locked away. They had locked themselves away in the upper room and they were afraid of any repercussions from the Jewish authorities. But when you think about it, that it actually draws me to a question. How do we account for the dramatic change in these disciples? There is a dramatic change, not only in the attitude, but in the behavior of these eleven in relatively short order, a matter of a few weeks, their lament was replaced with joy, their fear was transferred into faith, and their skepticism was replaced by a forceful and unashamed proclamation. You can read of this in the early chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, the history book of the New Testament. 
Peter, who runs away in fear, stands up in courage. The one who doubted now testifies. He says, men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was arrested by you, and who attested of who he was by many miracles, as you yourselves know, and who was put to death by cruel men, who was buried, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, he says, God raised from the dead. Now I'm going to assume that for at least a few of you that this warrants a few minutes of consideration. I want to give a serious consideration to the resurrection. Two factors stand out, at least to me. Number one, the fact of the empty tomb. And number two, the transformation of these disciples. Now I know as well as you that there are many explanations in an attempt to disprove the resurrection. As a matter of fact, explanations disproving the resurrection are abundant. They really haven't changed a whole lot in detail in my lifetime. Maybe and not yours as well. Now, leaving aside the trivial ones like, well, the reason that they thought that it was an empty tomb was because those women went to the wrong tomb. It seems to me that this is rather unkind to the women, as if they wouldn't know their way around. Believe me, I've gone to many a cemetery hours after a committal service, and even if the sod is put back over the top of the grave, it is evident that there was something that happened here. It's obvious. So I won't spend a lot of time matter of fact, I think this one rather insults my intelligence. The second one that's propagated that I just, again, it says that these were ignorant people. I mean, in people of the first century, they weren't as sophisticated as we are. Yeah, I know. They were the ones that built, built those, those elevated water things that took water hundreds of miles so that the Roman citizens would be able to have fresh water to drink. Oh yeah, they, they were the people that developed this system of government that had checks and balances. They developed roads that are better than those in Oklahoma. Not saying much, is it? But they did. The primary explanation as to why we don't believe in the resurrection Basically fourfold. I, I hit them very quickly. Number one, because Jesus never really died. Number two, the disciples came and they stole the body. Number three, the whole thing is a fabrication. They just made it up. Or number four, the body was stolen by the Jewish authorities. Now, those are the ones that seemingly have the most credence. All of this is out there for our consideration. The honest seeker, the genuine person who is wondering about these things, take these explanations for why it's true or why it's not, and they ask himself this question, do these explanations do justice to the facts that are presented? I suggest that individuals need to be prepared to ask another question as well. What if it's true? When you read the Bible, it doesn't come across like mythology. C.S. Lewis on one occasion in one of his books says, you know I've spent my entire career as an English professor dealing with mythology and dealing with legend. I know about mythology. I know what it sounds like. I know what it reads like. And when I began to read the New Testament, it didn't seem at all like that is what it was. It wasn't written in the kind of phraseology and the terminology and the framework of mythology. No, it actually was kind of core guy. It was listed. It was laid out. 
it was almost as if it was an account of what took place. Listen to Paul as he opens up with what was the classic chapter on the resurrection in all of his writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just listen. I deliver to you what is of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, identifying Peter, and then the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, saying that, hey, if you want to, you can get a vote on it. You can, you can get them to raise their hand. Yes, I've seen him. And then he appeared to James, all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. Paul goes on in that chapter to drive home the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a game changer. He says, if he is not alive, then any notion of forgiveness of sins and all of this idea of about eternal life is completely fabricated. However, he says, if this whole thing is true, and then he goes on to say what follows. His point is, the resurrection is not something that is tacked on to the story of Christianity. Christianity isn't morality and ethics and about being a kind person. Christianity is not. It's not what it's about. He's not saying there are a few crazies in this realm of Christianity who got a hold of this resurrection thing and they just won't let it go. The fact is the resurrection is the very heart of the story. Without the resurrection... Christianity collapses like a broken folding chair. But the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus are one undeniable act of God. And when you read the testimony, you realize that that's the case. Christianity, without the resurrection, is not Christianity at all, but rather a lie. Faith in the resurrection doesn't ask you to check your mind at the door. Uh, the concept that faith and reason are incompatible is only propagated by the reason crowd. They deny faith. You see, the faith crowd never will ask you to deny reason. The Bible is not calling for people to exercise what is referred to as blind faith. Blind faith asks you to stop thinking and start believing. Now, there might be times in the Bible in which you can't figure out what God's doing or what his plan is. But you're never told to stop thinking about it. The New Testament, in the very way it unfolds, asks you to think it asks you to consider. It asks you to reason. To think. Well, that in and of itself might be the problem. In the Wall Street Journal on December the 18th last year, and I, I know that because I wrote this down. I, I didn't go out here looking for a good illustration for the Wall Street Journal, in case you're wondering that. I, I read this and I wrote it down on December the 18th of December last year because it smacked me right in the face as to what I was feeling. The journalist said, we are washed in a media-generated bath of emotion. How do you feel has replaced what happened? As an obligatory question the reporter asked. Now, now, check me out on this and see if I'm right. They rush to the scene and they don't ask, what's happened here? But rather they write or they report or they ask, how do you feel about what's happened here to you? And we've been conditioned to see everything that happens from an emotional point of view. Check me out here. You know, even in a golf tournament, for goodness sake, 
How much more boring could it possibly be to sit there and watch television as some guy who can do everything in the world with a set of clubs and a ball, you know, play this game and everybody watches it. Well, check me out. See if I'm right. See if I'm wrong. As it gets very close to the end of the tournament, the music changes. And the outcome seems to be obvious. And here comes the sob stories about the man who is about to win and his grandpa is, is a great man and, and sadly enough, just two days earlier, he was put into the hospital and he, he's not doing very well, but from his bed, he is talking to us about how much this tournament means to him. For goodness sakes, folks, turn the piano music off. You stop the nonsense. Don't you think that I'm intelligent enough to who is about to win this thing? Emotion, without reason and intellect, has taken over. And it's taken over American Christianity. It comes to embedding here in us so much so that when the issue of Christianity is spoke of and the minister comes up and he starts getting on a very technical, hard subject, something that he asks you to think about, the, the organ music comes on. And things start to get a little quiet and, and you're waiting for the people to stand up and say, well, now wait a minute, these things are difficult to think about and they can't think very hardly and so let's, let's, let's get the music going. No! I'm sick of it. When the New Testament asks us to think deeply, it is doing so that we would have a mental exercise resulting in a logical conclusion as to what we seriously considered. Well, I better get back to the issues, okay? Let's get back to this. Answering the deniers. Number one, Jesus really didn't die. Now, at the, at the worst, this explanation says that one of the thieves crucified with him was actually a doctor. And since, you know, they, they weren't really dead, and with the uh, spices and the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, what do I want to say, the, the dampness of the tomb, one of them actually went over and patched him up enough so that he could roll the stone away and that he could get out there and get on with his life. Well, let me ask you, how does that strike you? How much faith do you really have to have to believe in that one? Some even go as far to say, is, well, there was an earthquake. You know that, Don. And that's why the stone rolled away. And it was so violent, that's what woke him up. Because he really wasn't dead. Now, the other day, when I was sitting at the couch and the, and the, and the or ground began to shake, I thought Riley was behind the couch with his tail hitting up against the thing, but things kept moving, and we had an earthquake. Do you remember, remember that? Now, if I was dead, I wouldn't feel the earthquake, okay? I want everybody here to know that. When you're dead, you don't feel nothing. You're dead. I just think I can trust the Roman soldiers on this one. After all, they knew the difference between somebody fainting and someone dying. I mean, that was their whole business. Execution. They were executioners. Executioners know when they have accomplished what they set out to do. That's why the gospel records that when they came to the body of Jesus, having broken the bones and the legs of the others, in order to create asphyxiation, they did not break his legs because he was already dead. And so just to make sure they take a spear and they stick it in his sturm and there shouldn't be any question in our minds that Jesus was dead. Frankly, if that doesn't convince you then what do you make of the record of John's gospel where he says that Nicodemus remember the guy who came to Jesus at night showed up at the tomb of Jesus bringing a mixture of spices and alloys about 75 pounds in weight and they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloth with the spices as a burial custom. 
Now let me just ask you a question. You're lying there in your bed. You're not feeling particularly well after all. You just got beat half to death. They put you on a cross. They nailed you there. And somehow you got down. And then there comes your friend and he walks into your bedroom and he takes the sheets and he starts wrapping you up and then he starts putting 75 pounds of ointments on your chest. Now I'm not a doctor, but I'm here to say you're probably dead at this point. Well, they said that Jesus really wasn't dead. i got to speed this up. Number two and number three, the disciples came and they stole him away and then they made the whole thing up. Well, I guess my first question, and you know, I'm not an attorney, but uh, thank God. I think one of my first questions would be, what's the motivation of these disciples to come in and steal the body? Obviously, the answer to that would be, well... They want to lie about it. Okay, hold that thought. That is exactly what the record says that the Jewish authorities, the Jewish leaders, said to the guards that were guarding the, the tomb. We will give you money if you say that his disciples came and they stole him. So this idea that he's, that he's stolen by the disciples is 2,000 something years old. So I ask, okay, therefore they knew that he was dead, didn't they? So that eliminates the first one. And these disciples, they, they come in and they steal him, and assumingly, they hide the body. Now somehow, on the strength of all that, they go out and they get themselves killed telling the story that Jesus rose from the dead. I, 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 I've got to be honest, okay? There are some religious nuts out there, fanatics, that they would even die. They would be a martyr. We see that every day. There, there are religious fanatics who will die for a cause that they believe to be true. But in this case, you're asking me to believe that these disciples knew that it was not true. And on the fabrication of a lie... They were willing to keep quiet and die themselves. We're being asked to believe that they knew that it was a flat out lie. And then based upon that lie, they went out and they transformed the world. What do sensible people think about such a thing? Well, I think you'll agree. Number four, his body was stolen by the Jewish authorities. Now i got to go back to this. Why? Why would they do that? And if they did, third day comes around. Here comes all these disciples. He's risen. He's risen. What do you do? You go out and get the body. And you, and you say, no, he didn't. Here he is. And squitch the whole thing. You say, on the basis of all that, Don, you have used the New Testament. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Of course I have. Because that the New Testament in and of itself is part of the evidence that needs to be considered. And, I, and I, ask, I ask this very simple. Why would you ever have to have a New Testament? Why would anyone ever take the trouble to write this stuff down? There are all kinds of people saying all kinds of things, making all kinds of claims at this point in history. But in this case... Jesus is the one who makes the outstanding claims, the uh, exaggerated claims. They're all out there for you to know, and they're unfulfilled. And everything in his life all of a sudden comes crashing to a halt on a Friday, and they put him on the cross. He dies, he's buried in a tomb, and they say, why don't we write this stuff down and make everyone believe that it's something other than what it really is? I don't think that you're prepared to go there, are you? There's not a page of the New Testament absent from the conviction that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. They picked up their pens to write, not in order to invent 
the risen Jesus, but because they had encountered the risen Jesus. Again, it comes across like some categorical writing terms. John says, listen, that which was from the beginning, which was shared with that which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked on, we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life is made manifest. We see it. We testify to it. We proclaim it to you. Eternal life, which is now ours, is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's categorical. There's no way around it. It's either fact or fiction. John actually concludes his gospel by saying, there are many things that Jesus did. I didn't write them down. But I have written these things down in order that you might believe and that you, by believing, might have eternal life in his name. So what's he saying? He is saying that the propagation of the gospel, the the progression to living faith in Jesus is first and foremost a consideration of who he is and what he has done. In other words, here's the evidence. Examine the evidence. Since the evidence provides significant enough here for you to reason it out, I want you to trust in it. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Evidence does not compel belief. If it did, no one would ever smoke cigarettes. Evidence does not in itself compel belief. The evidence gives significant basis for further consideration. The evidence makes you think about it. Belief then sets up the question within us to ask, Is this more believable than that? Is it trustworthy? Can I act upon it? And then in believing, you discover life in his name. Now, I say to you, the question here this morning is, what if it's all true? The gospel's not about ideas. It's not about good things or thinking good things. It's about God doing something in history. It's not another story of some Galilean carpenter who went around with some really cool thoughts. It actually is that Jesus is God in the flesh. That God invaded time and space, and then in doing so, he came to fulfill a purpose. To take a broken world and fix it. So that men and women might know what it is to love God and to live in his presence for all of eternity. That's why it says very straightforwardly that Christ died for our sins that Christ was buried, that Christ was raised from the dead. Again, Good Friday and Easter are one indivisible act of God. And if you're a Christian here today, you believe in the risen Lord. Or, you don't believe at all. You see, the risen Lord in whom you believe is Jesus who died an atoning death for your sins. And by his death and resurrection, as Paul says in Romans 4, by his death and resurrection, Jesus has achieved salvation for all those, get this, who trust in him. He delivered over death for our sins and raised again to secure our justification. He has achieved salvation for all of those who trust in him. He's not achieved salvation for all of those who say, yeah, 
I believe that there was a Jesus. He has not achieved salvation for all of those who say, yeah, you know that Sermon on the Mount. Boy, now that's a good document. He has not achieved salvation for those who say, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be a nicer and much better person than I was the first 20 years of my life. He has achieved salvation for all who trust in him. And I emphasize that point. And I ask you a very evasive question. Now, I'm not going to come there and point you out and sit next to you, put my arm around you and convince you to do something. Have you ever come to Jesus Christ and trusted him? Have you ever come to Jesus Christ and trusted him. In other words, in the words of an old song from my childhood, he did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to save he came. And when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, then we call him by his name. Have you ever come to Jesus and said, you know the problem Lord Jesus is not this world. And our world is in a mess, isn't it? The problem is my mess. My sins. Have you ever come to Jesus and said, Lord Jesus, you are the only one who can act and set my guilty conscience free. You are the only one who can break the bondage of my soul. You're the only one who can bring me into the presence of God. You're the only one who can enable me to live for God's glory. Now you might say, I like some of that, Don. But there's part of that there that is just really rough for me, that, that sin part. I, I get it. I get it. I wouldn't like to have my sins of my past, this, just, just this past week, just this past week, I would not want my sins put up here on this screen for everybody to look at and to know about. First of all, I've got to tell you, the screen wouldn't hold them. Not big enough. Which one of us are prepared to stand and say, I want all of my evil, all of my bad thoughts, everything I've done this past week, I'm going to have it put up here on the screen for everybody to see. I don't think any of us vote on that one. Those sins that separated me from a holy God, those sins that have to be dealt with in one way or another. And that's why each one of us try to deal with them. We do. Some of us try to deal with it by comparison. Say, uh, you know, I'm not what I'm supposed to be, but you know what? I'm not nearly as bad as she is. Or he is. Or if you're like me, you do the greatest cover-up job that's ever happened in the face of the earth. It's a snow job from the very beginning. I mean, it's cut, and man, you, you do it. You cover it up. Or you simply say, who cares? <laughs> Why should I care? Who are you to go around saying what is sin and what is not? I didn't say I was going to put your sins up here. I said you put your sins up here. The fact is that there's none of us that are good enough to pay for the price of our sin in and of ourselves. There's no other than Jesus who was good enough to pay for the price of our sin. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you're saved. Now I want you to notice here, there's no five-step plan, 12-step plan, three-step plan. There it is. 
there's a conviction of the heart. There is a confession in life. And then there's a transformation. Now someone might say, you know, you know it just can't be that simple. It can't be that straightforward. And well, no, it can't. But then yes, it is. Salvation does have a great cost. That's the significance of the death of Jesus. And it has contained in this story the greatest mystery that's ever been revealed to man. That by believing in him, that he forgives me and cleanses me from all unrighteousness. But I know this morning that I can't do one thing. I can't move you one inch closer to trusting Christ. And to be honest, that's somewhat frustrating. The way salvation happens is that Jesus, the risen Christ, calls out to you through his living word and calls out to you through his written work. Let me see if I can put that simply for you. To remember sometime, and some of you this is going to be very clear to you, others absolutely not, so I'll, I'll attempt it anyway, that you remember when you were younger and much younger, and some of you much, much, much younger, were living in your parents' home, and for one reason or another, they had to wake you up early in the morning before 10.30. And they, they called your name. Now, I believe that you'll agree that you started hearing before you really even realized that they were calling to you. I think they, that started out as some kind of noise that, that woke you up. And then as they said, you know, Phil, or maybe she called you Philip, it's time to get up. And I know with some of you, you had very loving, kind mothers. And so they said it very softly and gently, not to disturb you. Wake up. Wake up. Actually, you woke up before you realized that they were calling your name. And then when you heard your name, as a, and you'll all agree, a very obedient child, you immediately got up and got dressed. I want you to remember a story in the Bible where Jesus walks into a daughter's bedroom in which they said she had died. And I want you to listen to the words that Jesus says. Little girl, wake up. And the people look at him and they say, how crazy. What a strange thing to say. You remember the story? You remember what happened? She woke up. And if you're a Christian here this morning, that's happened to you. God's word spoke to you. God's word called out to you. It might be somewhat unsettling for you because you find yourself saying, you know, I would have never gone and listened to that guy. I, I don't even know why I'm here. I, I don't know what's up with me. I don't even know why. The word explains that as you heard noise. And then somewhere along the way, you realized Jesus was calling your name. He loves me. He knows me. He's calling out to me as if it were all true. 
Now, C.S. Lewis describes what happens the first time that he visited Oxford. He, he was looking forward to it because he knew of the architecture and he knew of the beauty of the buildings and the majesty. And he said that when he came out of the railroad station that he turned in what proved to be the opposite direction. You remember the rule if you're riding with me and you say, which way should we go, left or right? If I say right, you turn left, okay? If I say left, you turn right because I always pick the wrong direction first. And he gets out of the train station and he turns the wrong way. He's walking away from Oxford. As he walked, he says to himself, you know, this isn't as impressive as I thought it would be. Um, the shops here, they're, they're not as great. And the buildings here aren't as magnificent as what I have been told. This isn't what I thought it was to be. And then he stopped and turned around and he saw Oxford in front of him. And he said, you know, that actually became an illustration for my entire life. I had concluded that all of this Christianity stuff was not as inspiring as people say that it was. But I was walking in entirely the wrong direction. It was when, by God's grace, I turned around. The Bible says that is repentance. And I saw before me the magnificent truth of what it really was all about. You see, we have an answer. We have, we have a story to tell to the nations we used to sing about. This is a desperately sick world this morning. It, it's a messed up world. I don't think I could get anyone to vote against me on that one. Our world is broke. They have taken what is right and said that it is wrong. And they've taken that which is clearly wrong and they've said it's right. Just talk to somebody who's, who's uh, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. Growing up in America today. They find no intentional origin. It just, some warm thing got warmed up by something on some day. And it just ended up and here I am. And they teach that stuff. As if it's true. I don't know where I came from, they'll tell you. And they see themselves as nothing more than a recollection of molecules held in suspension. They have no idea toward which they should move. They have no path in which they should take. They are confused as to where they came from. And they have no idea where they're going. That's today. Most people. And when it comes to the story of Jesus, they're just as confused. They don't know. And it's our privilege. And it's our responsibility. As we affirm these things to go out into the realm of science and art and media and journalism and in the law and education and the totality of life and live out the realities of the fact that this story is the very essence of what it means to come to God and to hear Him and to live for Him. I have an illustration from Acts chapter 17. I believe the greatest preacher that ever lived was the Apostle Paul. I've read extensively his work. I've studied him all of my life. I've seen all of his methodologies. I've seen every one of his outlines. Honestly, I have even read the book by Barclay that said The Mind of the Apostle Paul. It's about that thick, little bitty print. And I took it with me on a trip to Hawaii one time on this eight-hour plane ride from Dallas. 
And I said, this will put me to sleep. I was so angry when I read every single word of it. The Apostle Paul says, God has overlooked times of ignorance and now he commands people everywhere to repent, to turn around. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And all of this he has given assurance to all of it by raising this one Jesus from the dead. In essence, he says, here's the heart of it all. We know that his sacrifice is acceptable by God because of the resurrection. We know that God will have the final word because he rose from the dead. And Luke tells us now when they heard this term, the resurrection of the dead, they began to mock him. They began to make fun of him. And the others said, I'd like to hear more about that. So Paul went out from them and some men joined him and believed while most turned aside. It actually names three. Three people. Not particularly successful in his evangelistic effort. Here's one of the the greatest preachers the world has ever known, Paul, taking on the intelligentsia of the day, laying out for them the masterful skill, reaching to the very end in which he says, you know the issue here is the fact that Jesus is alive and has been risen from the dead. And people said, you've got to be kidding me. I can't believe that an intelligent individual like yourself would still be trotting out that same old stuff. That was the response of Athens. And quite frankly, that's most of the response today. Some of you are going to walk out of here and say the same thing. What in the world was that all about? What was he off on? What what was his point? And some of you will hear the Easter story and say, yeah, he's alive. No longer is it just noise, but you actually hear God speaking to you this morning. You actually hear him saying your name. There was a story that took place some time ago, but it's, it, it's just so true. I've seen this happen over and over again. This story happens to be about a guy by the name of William Pitt, the younger, who was Prime Minister of Great Britain. He was just 24 years old. He had a very close friend. His name was Wilbur Force. He was the guy that took on the slave trade back in the early 1800s. Wilbur Force loved William Pitt. There's no question. He just thought he was the greatest mind the world had ever known. And he believed that Jesus was God and that he was raised from the dead. Now, because he loved William and he loved the Lord, he went to get William to go to church with him. Maybe like someone here this morning. You've been invited. Somebody's talked you into coming. Someone's asked you to be here. That's what happened. On one particular occasion, when they were there in church, sitting next to one another, William Force's favorite preacher comes to the platform and he delivers what is uh, it's called a stirring message. And, uh, 
Wilbur was held by it. I mean captivated with every word. Encouraged. And very excited as he was at the end when the benediction was, was given. He looked over to his friend who happened to be the Prime Minister of Great Britain next to him to see what his reaction was going to be. And Pitt turned to him and he said, can you tell me what in the world this guy was talking about? What was this guy on? What was his point? It wasn't because Pitt was, couldn't understand. He was an intelligent man. For here we see again an example. Two men sitting in the same church, sitting in the same pew, on the same Sunday, listening to the same preacher, listening to the same sermon. And one walks out and says, I don't have a clue what that was about. I guess William Pitt never heard him call his name. But I ask you, have you heard your name? Then trust him. Have you heard him call out to you? Then trust him. Discover that in Christ alone, you can have everything that you need for life and death and beyond. Let's pray.